Good morning, everyone. Esteemed jury, dear participants, listeners, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Student Scientific Society of Medical University of Silesia in Katowice, I would like to thank you for coming and taking part in International Medical Congress of Silesia 2023. My name is Aleksandra Broskowiak and I have an honor of moderating and it is my pleasure to coordinate the clinical medicine session. I would like to cordially welcome esteemed jury, the president of the jury, Docent Łukasz Budak, and the members of jury, Dr. Marcin Basiak, and Docent Agnieszka Zachurzok, online. We would like to explain to you the rules of the session. The order of the presentation will be the same as in the abstract book. The maximal time for presentation is seven minutes and three minutes for the discussion. If the presenter exceeds the time, he or she needs to move on the conclusions and finish the presentation as soon as possible. Esteemed jury, we would like to kindly remind you that if you are the supervisor of the paper which is presented, you should not assess the work. In that case, please cross out the number on your card or simply just don't push any button on your form online. In that case, please just move to the next presentation. Other members of the same clinic are able to assess the presentation. The assessment will be verified. All the presentations and the discussion must be run in English. We kindly ask the jury to assess the scientific value, way of presenting, discussion and own contribution. When the session ends, we kindly ask you to give the cards back to the coordinator and send it via email if you're online. To begin, I think we can start with the pre first presentation, so please welcome Barbara Janota. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Barbara Janota. I am a dietitian and also a PhD candidate at the Department of Basic Medical Sciences in Bytom. Today, I would like to share with you my results of the study connected with lifestyle elements of women with Hashimoto's disease. The work's tutor is Pani Dr. Habilitowana Nauk Medycznych, Ewa Janczewska. Yes, I, I can change this, the slide. Can you? Yes, it, it should work. Yes, now, now it works. Yes, so as you know, in Hashimoto disease, the lifestyle elements and nutritional behaviors are really important because it can affect the core and the progression of the disease and consequently it can also affect the quality of life. As a doctors and as a dietitians, we should uh, support the thyroid hormone production and of course we can uh, help in inhibition of the anti-inflammatory process. The aim of the study was to assess the lifestyle elements and the quality of life of women with hypothyroidism, which was caused by Hashimoto's disease. And the second aim was to identify the areas in lifestyle that required changes. 
The study group contained of 88 women diagnosed with, with hypothyroidism in the course of Hashimoto's disease. And what's quite interesting, only 31% of the study group had the proper body weight. Then let's move to the methods. Uh, this uh, study is an anonymous study. I used here two questionnaires. The first uh, to assess the nutritional behaviors and lifestyle elements, and the second one uh, invented by World Human Organization in the short part, which assess the quality of life. So let's start with the results. I would like to start uh, to uh, explain or to show you the results of uh, nutrition behaviors. And as first, I will tell you about the uh, products which are recommended in our diet. As you know, we have some recommendations for eating the food products. For example, vegetables should be eaten a few times a day. And in here, you can see that vegetables were eaten a few times a day by only 42% of the study group. Then, the legume seeds. Legume seeds should be eaten at least once a week. And in here, you can see that once a week, declared only 28% of the study group. Then, let's move the, to the fish consumption. Fish are very important in our diet because they, con they contain the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And these unpolyunsaturated fatty acids can, uh, can have the anti-inflammatory impact on our health. So in here, uh, you, you can see that a few times a week, fish were eaten only by 17% of the study group. And something positive, that the nuts were eaten as a snacks by 42% of the study group. That's uh, very important because snacks contain a lot of micro elements. For example, the Brazil nuts contains selenium, which has anti-inflammatory impact also. Then the unhealthy food products. In here you can see that the fast food products were eaten by the most part of the study group from one to two times a month. Then the sweets. Sweets were eaten by the biggest part of the study group a few times a week. Then fried products. Uh, the biggest part of the study group ate, ate fried products a few times a week. And what's, uh, what is not uh, good for us it, that is that uh, the processed meat uh, was uh, eaten uh, daily by 29% uh, of the study group. I haven't mentioned it before, but in here I, can, I would like to show you that I also calculated the healthy diet index. Below you can see which way I calculated it. And it occurred that the um, diet of this woman has low intensity of unhealthy and also the healthy uh, elements uh, products. So this diet is on the medium uh, health level. Then let's move to the non-nutritional lifestyle elements. Here you can see that over 90% of the study group don't smoke and 35% don't drink alcohol. That's terrifying, but over 50% but over of the study group has low physical activity level. That's, that's really terrifying. And uh, also 36% of the study group sleeps less than six hours a day. And the last uh, part of the results, uh, the results connected with quality of life, um, over 50% of the study group declares that their uh, uh, quality of life uh, is uh, good and uh, over 10% declares the very good quality of life. Uh, and the last, my sent last sentence is about uh, self-assessment of health. And in here you can see that 33% of the study group declared that their um, health is better than their peers. To conclude, the lifestyle elements of women with Hashimoto's disease are mostly incorrect. We should implicate changes, we should educate about impl changes impl implementation, uh, like for example, we should encourage our patients to eat more uh, healthy products, to increase the physical activity level, 
we should educate this very important uh, study because in the, it shows us that we should educate about the anti-inflammatory diet and of course we should educate that the diet has um, the possibility of support the production of thyroid hormones. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be delighted answering them. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now I would like to ask you to enter the discussion. Do you have any questions? Both participants and the jury can ask questions. <clears throat> so, uh, as far as I know, um, maybe I will rephrase it. Do you know any specific diet uh, for patients with Hashimoto disease? Are there any uh, data to support the specific diet or those were just a recommendation for, a, let's say, a healthy diet? In Hashimoto disease, we should uh, encourage people to eat, uh, all, of course, healthy, but this, this diet should have uh, the higher impact of uh, anti-inflammatory products like vegetables, fruits, of course, fish, nuts, but uh, it, there, was, uh, there, there isn't an uh, invented uh, diet typical for Hashimoto's disease. Now we haven't invented uh, such, a, such a diet. I have a question, Kai. Sure. Um, thank you for this presentation. It is, it is quite interesting. And uh, I think that uh, not only Hashimoto the patients uh, have to eat a healthy diet, I think it's full of the anti inflammatory um, food. Um, my question is if you have any data about the diet comparing this, uh, this your results to uh, women without Hashimoto disease. Are there, their diet is better or, or is this comparable to, the, to, to, to your group, to the study group? This is the aim of my uh, doctoral uh, studies to assess the quality of life and the lifestyle elements of women with uh, Hashimoto and, and with hypothyroidism and the comparison of their diet and their, their life, uh, life choices to, to the woman without these diseases. So, so I, I can, uh, now I'm trying to, to find out where, is, is there any um, difference? And uh, I now I also try to, to, to have the information about uh, the impact of the diet of, of a woman with Hashimoto and without Hashimoto. So now I, I try to, to have some information, but, but there is not uh, a lot of information now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion, for your presentation and for the questions. And now please welcome our second presenter with the presentation Physical Activity and Pelvic Floor Muscle Training in Postpartum Women. No. Uh, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Sabina Tim. I'm a physiotherapist and a PhD student from Jagiellonian University Medical College. And the title of my presentation is Physical Activity and Pelvic Floor Muscle Training in Postpartum Women. All we know, physical activity is necessary for our health especially during postpartum period, because it maintains healthy body weight, also alleviates the symptoms of depression, what in general uh, improves the quality of life. 
And the other very important exercise during postpartum is pelvic floor muscle training, which strengthens the pelvic floor, increase the endurance, what reduce the symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunctions like urinary incontinence, anal incontinence, uh, or prolapse. And the correct way to perform these exercises is to squeeze the pelvic floor muscles, lift them up during exhalation, and when we inhale, these muscles should be relaxed. So the aim of the study was to assess the frequency and correctness of pelvic floor muscle training and level of physical activity at six weeks postpartum in women who had supervised uh, physical therapy training, online training, or have no intervention. 342 women on the third or fourth day of childbirth participated in the study. Uh, women were randomly assigned to three groups. First group, uh, control group, where uh, women uh, receive only education, instructions about pelvic floor muscle training and instructions about uh, daily living activities. And the second group, uh, online exercises, women had also education and then three sessions uh, of online exercises via Google Meet in the real time with a physiotherapist. And the third group, supervised exercises, when women had uh, also education and three sessions of supervised exercises in the gym with a physiotherapist. And six weeks after delivery, uh, women filled the author's questionnaire, which include questions about pelvic floor muscle training and the international physical activity questionnaire to assess uh, the level of physical activity. There were no uh, significant differences between the groups. Uh, the mean age uh, of women were 31 years. Most of them uh, lived in big city as well as was uh, primiparous, and about half of them uh, had a vaginal delivery. So let's switch to the results. Most of the women uh, declare that they practice pelvic floor muscle training uh, in postpartum. However, few of them uh, do it correctly. And when we compare these results between the groups, we can observe uh, that the significant differences is between control group and supervised group. Approximately 64% of women from the control group practice pelvic floor muscle training versus 91% uh, of women from the supervised group. But when we look at the correctness uh, of these exercises, it's getting worse because only 23% uh, percent of women from the control group uh, exercise correct versus approximately 65% percent of women from the supervised group. And what about the level of physical activity? Unfortunately, one quarter of postpartum women were not physically active enough and uh, most of the women uh, were minimally active. But when we look at the moderate level of uh, physical activity, which, uh, for example, include a uh, quick walk or low cardio fitness, uh, we can see that this kind of activity is undertaken uh, by approximately 58% of women from the supervised group, uh, what is a significant difference between the control group and online group, where only about 40% of women uh, performed this kind of exercises. So uh, there's a relation between the level of uh, physical activity and correctness of pelvic floor muscle training. Women who spent uh, more energy also performed pelvic floor muscle training better, which is obvious because what I presented previous uh, is that women from the supervised group exercised better uh, and also had higher level of uh, physical activity. But we found also other relation between the sitting time and performing pelvic floor muscle training. Uh, women who spend more time sitting also declare that they practice uh, pelvic floor muscle training uh, more often. And we found also uh, other relation between the sitting time and paros and type of delivery. Primiparous women and women after caesarean section spend more time sitting than multiparous women and women after vaginal delivery. 
So knowing this, we know which group of women we should engage to be more active during postpartum period. So closing, most women after childbirth declare that they practice uh, pelvic floor muscle training, uh, but few of them do it correctly. Supervised training with physiotherapists seems to be the most effective way to get the correct pelvic floor muscle training and the level of physical activity is related with correctness of pelvic floor muscle training. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now let's move to the discussion. Do you have any questions? Uh, did you use any um, health quality scale with comparison to your results? Uh, no, uh, here we use only uh, author's questionnaire uh, and uh, international physical uh, activity questionnaire to assess this. Uh, but it's the last stage of my uh, work uh, because the um, aim of my uh, PhD thesis is to correlate this with uh, diastasis recti abdominis and pelvic floor muscles dysfunctions. And here is just uh, one part uh, of my questionnaires which I used. Okay, thank you. for. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, work here, but I was wondering whether you uh, considered the the reason for the such a high rate of dropout in uh, patients who need to attend to the uh, gym and is there any window of opportunity to help them using those online methods, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, because uh, it was terrible when I uh, recruited these patients, because uh, I asked uh, more than 500 women to participate in the study and uh, give them an oppor opportunity to uh, be more active, to have uh, uh, exercises with physiotherapists. But uh, most of women rejected because they don't have time, uh, they don't uh, have anybody uh, uh, who can help uh, with the children. Uh, so I think that's why it's a lot of uh, dropouts because uh, I think here in our society, uh, there is still a thinking that uh, after uh, delivery, children uh, is the most important and women health is the second. You need to consider it as a study limitation because you cannot um, tell that it's a universal uh, truth because it strictly is connected with those who agreed to participate in the study. We don't know why they mm -hmm. didn't participate. What's the, what was the background? Oh, it was the same because uh, at the hospital uh, I asked them to participate uh, and they also agreed. Uh, but then when I contacted with them uh, to participate in the exercises, it was uh, this reason because uh, they don't have time uh, with children now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and for the discussion. And now let's move to the third presentation. The presentation title is To Vaccinate or Not to Vaccinate? Why Some People Do Not Want to Be Vaccinated Against COVID-19. See anything.
Okay, can we start? Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patryk Główczyński. I'm a medical doctor on my internship, and I'm in a doctoral school in Medical University of Silesia on clinical department of psychiatry. Uh, for today, I've got two researches for, uh, for you, and one of it is connected with vaccinations, and it is called to vaccinate or not to vaccinate why some people do not want to be vaccinated against COVID-19, analysis of some psychological factors connected with the decisions about vaccinations. The work tutor is Karina Badura-Brzoza, MD, PhD, clinical professor. COVID-19 was a threat to humanity. Almost 7 million of people died because of the complication of the infections. Everyone knew that science needed to create uh, some medication or vaccination for COVID. The first vaccine accepted by United States, European Union and United Kingdom was RNA based, uh, made by Moderna and Pfizer. And the second one uh, was based on adenovirus and it was made by AstraZeneca, um, probably Sputnik V and uh, Jensen. In Poland, around 60% of uh, population got two doses of vaccinations. Health and medical schoolers agreed that vaccinations uh, are one of the top of the achievement of medicine of 20th century. As long as vaccines exist, the anti-vaccinations movement formed. Uh, it's, it is not only about COVID-19, but uh, even in uh, 1885, uh, people protest against smallpox uh, vaccinations. Um, the most popular case with anti-vaccination history are probably connected with a man on, the, on that slide, the Andrew Wakefield. In 1998, uh, he published data showing that there is a relationship between the MMR uh, vaccine and inflammatory bowel disease and the development of autism. Uh, what's more, his research was published uh, in the one of the greatest and most uh, cited journal uh, in Lancet. Lately, when Wakefield was found to falsify his research uh, in 2010, the Lancet officially withdrew his uh, article. He also lost his medical doctor license and became the face of anti-vaxxers. But okay, what was the aim of the study? Because there, there are always some questions. Why some people believe in some art theory, the theories? Why some people didn't want to vaccinate? The aim of the study was to assess some mental factors that may be related to the attitude towards vaccination against COVID-19. Uh, what was the material of the study? There was uh, 419 respondents and uh, fully vaccinated was uh, 317 and um, uh, 102 uh, people uh, didn't want to get vaccine. As you can see, the age of these two groups was uh, pretty similar. The study was conducted online. In psychiatry, we normally use validate psychometric scales to assess some parameters. In this research, I chose the generic conspiracy belief scale, the PSS-10 scale, which assess perceived stress, and the state trait anxiety inventory, which assess anxiety as a feature of personality. Each participant had to fill all the scales and also the demographic data. And let's move to the results. Uh, in the vaccinated group, the mean GCBS score was uh, 34 points. And in the group of non-vaccinated respondents, the mean score uh, was uh, 48 points. Uh, of course, when comparing the two groups, a statistically significant, significant difference was assessed. And what is interesting in GCBS score, uh, the higher the score, the more likely to conspirational thinking. Uh, there, are uh, th there were significant positive correlation uh, between the results uh, obtained uh, in GCBS questionnaire and the results in the PSS 10 scale, as also with the results obtained the STAY X2 scale in vaccinated group. 
And what is really interesting, the same relationship was um, um, uh, was signif significant for the unvaccinated group. And the conclusions. Um, people presenting conspiracy thinking may be more a present anti-vaccination attitude compared to people not showing a tendency to this kind of thinking. Conspiracy thinking may be associated with the high level of anxiety as a personality trait, but also with the level of experience stress. And you know, uh, I would like to say something about the future implication of that research because you know, I know this is not a psychiatry conference and something should be said and done to get well understood the, the research. If we get to know that people like to think in a conspirational way uh, when they are in stress and uh, when they are feeling anxiety, we can provide some guidelines because before making some campaigns about vaccination, about new medications, new technology or whatever, you have to educate people. Education is always better than prohibition. And the higher education, higher awareness would lower the level of anxiety. And what is possible, the anxiety is the key. Thank you very much. And uh, remember, people are afraid of what they don't know. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting topic. So, do you have any questions? Well, <clears throat> I must admit that this is uh, important and a very difficult topic uh, because we are often uh, meet uh, those kind of patients with with their theories, um, but. Are you going to uh, implicate uh, specific um, methods of reducing the anxiety in those patients? What do you mean by getting them to know better or improve their knowledge? What, what would be the measures to, to undertake? I think the role of the public health at all is to educate people in a, as understandable way as it possible. Uh, when uh, you know when people is not um, when they don't have any knowledge about viruses uh, vaccines but not only that because the conspirational thinking is not only about vaccinations um, we have to uh, talk to them not in a scientific way uh, what's more uh, in poland we've got uh, a lot of anxiety as a personality trait uh, in population. Uh, it's not easy uh, in this country to uh, to get some new medications or, 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 or vaccinations. Uh, probably pediatrics um, can see it in their uh, cabinets. So um, <clears throat> I think uh, the language is the, mo uh, the most important as sometimes uh, you have to be also uh, understanding for lack of knowledge from the patients. And sometimes it's not, not that easy. Any other questions? Yes, I have, I could. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was really, really nice and interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in the socioeconomic background of your two groups, uh, vaccinated and not vaccinated, and this relation to anxiety and uh, to, 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 to stress. Do you have any data? Um, <clears throat> uh, yes, we have some, some data about it. And um, mostly uh, because, you know, it's, it's not easy to get information from uh, unvaccinated groups of people because they've got some tendency to not participate in any, uh, you know, scientific works. Uh, but um, this, um, this, uh, this people are from as well with the high level of education and uh, really low type of education as well with the vaccinated group. So uh, the level of education was not uh, statistically significant for, uh, for the differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I realize that it is, it is very tough to get the information, especially for yeah. uh, anti-vaccination uh, yeah. people. Yeah. So that, that was my question. Maybe yeah. you get some information. But I, I know, I know the, how 
how, how, how hard it is. And I, I'm, I'm, I realize about the bias related yeah. to, to, to getting this group to, to, to do some questionnaires. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion. And now let's move to the presentation number four. Uh, the presentation, the presenter also is here, Mr. Kuczynski, and the title is Assessment of Knowledge and Beliefs about Electroconvulsive ter Therapy among Medical Students. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's still me. So, uh, let's move maybe to the, uh, to the background of, uh, of my work. Okay. It's not a secret that psychiatry uh, as a field of medicine are still kind of magical for others. Sometimes we are even treated differently in hospitals. There are a lot of stigmatization of that field and one of it is connected with electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, you probably all know this movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest, or in Polish, Lot nad Kukułczym Gniazdem, uh, with uh, Jack Nicholson and uh, amazingly terrified Mildred Ratchet. Uh, but it's not the only movie which shows uh, ECT therapy in a different way, as a torture or uh, as a painful punishment. Uh, for some um, interesting facts uh, in some TV series called uh, Homeland, you can watch how uh, ECT is uh, correctly done. The ECT uh, is performed under general anesthesia with the usage of propofol, etomidat, ketamine, and succinylcholine. Normally, the procedure is performed with psychiatrist, anesthesiologist, and anesthesia nurse. The device of ECT uh, is connected and composed for, uh, of EEG and the generator of electricity. Patient don't remember anything and the whole procedure lasts about five to seven minutes. But okay, we can think why we perform it. Because ECT is a form of non-pharmacological uh, treatment for severe depression, treatment-resistant depression, severe mania, especially for catatonia, uh, agitation and aggression in people with dementia. But what is interesting, during pregnancy, ECT is the best treatment uh, for the developing fetus. What was the aim of the study? Uh, the aim of the study was to analyze the knowledge and beliefs of uh, medical students about electroconvulsive treatment. And the material, there was 143 sixth year medical students uh, with the mean age around 24 years. 83 people had the opportunity to observe the ECT when 60 students did not see the procedure. All of them have to complete three questionnaires, demographic data, the beliefs form, and the knowledge form. In knowledge questionnaire, probands could get one point for correct answer and zero point for wrong answer. The assessment was carried after classes in the subject of psychiatry, where one of the topics discussed was the uh, non-pharmacological method of treatment, and there is an ECT procedure in psychiatry. There are these methods like beliefs questionnaire and knowledge questionnaire, and uh, the Men Whitney U test was used to assess the difference between the groups in the uh, knowledge about ECT. And the results from demographic data: 94% uh, of probands all uh, answered that they learn about ECT treatment from psychiatry classes, 34% uh, from professional literature, and 24% uh, from the internet. Why this is important? Because of the stigmatization, you know, the source really matter. From the knowledge, students who had the opportunity to observe the ECT procedure got the mean score in knowledge questionnaire around 5.5 points, and in the group uh, who don't, do not see the procedure achieved a result uh, around 4.5 points. The difference was statistically significant. Uh, almost half of the respondents knew that memory loss was uh, the most common side effect after the procedure, but only 
almost, almost 19% knew that ECT does not cause permanent changes in this area. Beliefs. In the assessment of beliefs, over 70 of respondents declared that if necessary, they would undergo the procedure or recommend the procedure to the relatives. And 21 respondents think that ECT are painful in general, and 14% don't know if they are painful, but they can't say that they are definitely not. And we've got some uh, conclusions. Uh, people who had opportunity to watch the ECT show slightly more knowledge in this regard. The results uh, of the um, research suggest the necessity to uh, constantly expand the knowledge and shaping the right attitudes. Uh, you know, the stigmatization is one of the main challenges for psychiatrists as a whole. As you can see, the education is uh, really working, but we have to work even harder. Creating new correct attitudes among medical students uh, is as important as uh, teaching them uh, professional knowledge. Just because in medicine there is not about numbers, but uh, this is about people. And I want you to, to remember that. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you very much. Let's discuss the presented paper. Do you have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Mm, I must admit that uh, I'm pretty puzzled about the selection of the study group. Mm -hmm. Was those students aware that they are going to be tested with some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, evaluation prior to their classes? Were they assessed after the classes, before the classes, and why only the sixth year students? And in the topic, you are uh, generalizing it to all medical students. Mm, okay. Um, why sixth year medical student? Because uh, um, the psychiatry classes uh, took place uh, on fifth to six years and uh, in Tarnowskie Góry where I worked um, we performed ECT and the um, probably possibility to see the ECT uh, for students are, are, are not pretty big so um, it was uh, more um, I think uh, it was more confident to uh, ask sixth-year medical students where uh, they are almost a doctors, so they've got some uh, beliefs, they've got some knowledge, and uh, there is a big chance that, uh, that they saw the um, ECT because we are trying to show almost every medical student because on psychi psychiatry we've got um, lessons only with uh, medical students and paramedics. Uh, so, um, we are trying to show them, uh, all of them, uh, the ECT, but uh, mostly it's not, uh, it's not possible. But I think uh, it's why we generalize it, uh, because uh, I think that uh, this is important for every student to, uh, to know about this method and uh, know that this is, not, uh, this is not a torture, that this is not a punishment. And it was never. It was never a punishment. And my question is, how often um, are you using ECT per week, per month uh, in your department? Um, normally, uh, in our department, uh, depends on anesthesiologist. Um, we perform it two times a week. But uh, we would like to perform it every day. And we've got... Uh, We've got patience for that because uh, on uh, Silesia, uh, we are one of the few uh, clinic which, uh, which have uh, ECT. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions and your presentation. And now, please welcome another presenter. The presentation number five, type one of diabetes mellitus in an interdisciplinary perspective. There is no presenter or, or maybe online.
is there any of the part of the author online? If not, we will read the participants again in the very end, but let's move to the presentation number six. Please remember on your cards that this is the presentation number six. Uh, static stabilization in subjects with various norms of temporomandibular disorders. Esteemed jury, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alexandra Dolina and I am pleased to represent the Department of Sports Medicine at Medical University of Lublin. And today I will present uh, results of our study, Static Stabilization in Subject with Various Forms of Temporomandibular Disorders. So the temporomandibular disorders as defined as a group of musculoskeletal and neuromuscular disorders which include the dysfunction of the uh, temporomandibular joint, uh, the masticatory muscles, and the surrounding tissue. Uh, TMD are divided into subtypes, including myofascial and, and intraarticular uh, ailments, for example, these displacements, inflammation, degeneration, or joint pain. These particular subtypes differ in etiology and symptoms. For many years, it has been recognized that the organ of sight, vestibular system, uh, somatosensory system, and motor organ are responsible for the body balance. Uh, the, the literature points to numerous links between the structures of the uh, stomatognative system and the structures responsible for uh, body balance. Uh, however, the results of studies on this problem are inconclusive. Uh, recent uh, research indicates that uh, probably the, some subtypes of temporomandibular disorders affect the body balance. Taking this into account, uh, the aim of our study was to assess if particular form of DMD uh, affects static stabilization. From uh, 38 uh, subjects initially enrolled to the study, uh, one met the exclusion criteria and one uh, resigned from the study during the examination. Uh, uh, from uh, the 36 subjects finally included in the study, uh, 25 were positively diagnosed with TMD and 11 did not uh, reach any positive diagnosis with TMD and it was our control group. Out of 25 uh, subjects with TMD, 9 was diagnosed with myofascial form, 9 with uh, disc displacement um, subtype, and 7 had mixed diagnosis, so minimum to different diagnosis of TMD. A diagnosis of TMD was performed using Polish version of research diagnostic criteria. And a posture examination was uh, performed by use posturography tests with the use of uh, force platform Freemet Maxi in three occlusal conditions. First, mandibular rest position. Second, maximal clenching of the T. And third, maximal clenching of the T on the dental cotton rolls. And all these occlusal conditions were performed with eyes open and eyes closed. All these measurements were uh, taken for 30 seconds, with five seconds break between uh, the measurements. Uh, the subject was placed on a platform uh, located uh, 150 centimeters from the wall, uh, and the patient was uh, asked to assume a habitual position, but uh, trying to maintain as much stability as uh, he or she can. And postural sway area defined as a surface area of the center of uh, gravity sways and the velocity of COP sways were used for statistical analysis. Uh, in table uh, one, you can see that there were no statistic statistical significant differences be between the uh, control grab and the grab with um, different form of TMD in such characteristic as age, height, body mass index, and uh, body mass. And we perform two types of analysis. First, intragroup, that is a uh, uh, differences uh, of body balance in different um, 
occlusal condition in one group. And second type of analysis was intergroup analysis, so the differences between uh, the control group and the uh, group with uh, different uh, TMD diagnosis. Um, I'm sorry. And uh, in this table, you can see that uh, intra group um, analysis showed that in only in muscle disorders uh, group, uh, there are statistical significant differences. Um, when um, subject with muscle disorders clenching their teeth, uh, the body balance was uh, decreasing because the postural sway area uh, were, was uh, increasing. Uh, you can also see that in control grab, when a subject were um, clenching their teeth, the uh, body balance slightly improved. However, the value did not reach uh, the assumed uh, level of significant. Uh, you can also see that uh, intergroup uh, comparisons shows that the greatest uh, differences between the control grab and the grab with muscle disorders. And the same is shown uh, with the COP velocity comparison. The greatest differences were shown um, between the control grab and the grab with muscle uh, disorders. Uh, but here also you can see that um, in intra-group uh, comparisons, uh, grab with muscle disorders and with mixed diag uh, diagnosis show that when clenching their teeth, uh, the body balance uh, started to decrease. And to sum up, uh, the involvement of the muscular factor in temporomandibular disorders determines the occurrence of deviations in static balance of the body. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the presentation. Now let's move to the discussion. Are there any questions? Did you use any diagnostic imaging method for the inclusion or exclusion criteria? Uh, no, it is this uh, research, uh, no, but I extend this uh, research in my doctoral thesis uh, by use of uh, SAMG uh, and with um, T-scan to uh, analyze the occlusal conditions of the uh, patient. So in future studies, we extend a lot of uh, methods. Any other questions? Uh, can you share with us any potential practical uh, conclusions from, from the study? What can we get for patients according to your studies? Of course. Uh, so first, if we know now that the masticatory muscle can be one of the source of the body, body balance disorder, we can extend the diagnosis of patients with um, body balance disturbances to the masticatory organ, especially uh, masticatory muscles. Uh, to uh, try find the real source of the problem, especially when we don't see any disturbances in vestibular system, uh, the organ of sign, and other uh, structures that are responsible for body balance. And uh, secondly, we also know that the body uh, balance is responsible for body posture. And when we have a body balance disorders, our uh, musculoskeletal system are adapt to this situation. Uh, we, what can lead to problem with uh, pain in uh, musculoskeletal system? So when we know that um, patients with TMD can have problem with body balance, we can prevent this um, problem with uh, pain uh, in an early stage of TMD. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we invite the presenter number seven, global longitudinal strain improvement after cross scatter edge to edge mitral wall repair pilot study. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomasz Galina. I am medical doctor and PhD candidate in the uh, Department of Cardiology and Structural Heart Disease uh, in Katowice. And today I'm honored to present you results of uh, my pilot study named uh, Global Longitudinal Strain Improvement After Transcatheter Mitral Valve Repair. 
so now you can see plan of my presentation. Firstly, I want to uh, tell you something about uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, mitra clip and GLS. Uh, then I will tell you uh, about aim of the study, study population characteristic. Finally, I uh, present you results of my study and tell about conclusion. And after the presentation, I will honor to answer your questions. Uh, so everyone knows cardiologists loves abbreviation. First abbreviation, which is important in my presentation, is SMR. SMR is secondary mitral regurgitation. Uh, SMR is consequence of left heart uh, disease, but uh, it's also indicator of worse clinical outcome. SMR is associated with atrial fibrillation, left pulmonary uh, function decreasing, and uh, development of pulmonary hypertension, and it's uh, associated with higher risk of death. Uh, Treatment of mitral regurgitation is firstly cardiosurgeric, but secondary mitral regurgitation uh, usually occurs among specific subgroup of patients uh, which are uh, with many comorbidities and uh, high uh, surgical risk. And uh, newest uh, ESC guidelines uh, tell we may uh, consider uh, trans uh, catheter edge to edge repair in such uh, of population. Uh, trans catheter edge to edge, uh, so is second abbreviation in this presentation tier, uh, is microinvasive uh, method of treatment, uh, which is far less aggravating than a surgical uh, operation. Uh, mitral clip is a commercial system dedicated for mitral valve. And uh, TIR is a proven method uh, which improve uh, quality of life and uh, relieving symptoms. Uh, and uh, last abbreviation uh, which is important is GLS. GLS is Global Longitudinal Strain. It's a relative new uh, echocardiographic uh, measurement. Uh, it's a sensitive marker of left ventricle function. Uh, it's, uh, calculate by semi-automatic analysis of uh, speckle uh, around cardiac cycle, and it's uh, now commonly used uh, among patients with heart failure as a, a predictor marker. Uh, now you can see how uh, measurements of GLS is made, and uh, crucial uh, information for further uh, slides, it's uh, there must be ECG uh, line record if you if you want to uh, measure GLS. Okay, so aim of my study is retrospective analysis of periprocedural echocardiographic parameters among patients with tears uh, performed because of uh, secondary mitral regurgitation. Uh, and it's a pilot study to assess feasibility of further studies and to calculate uh, minimal uh, study uh, groups in further studies. Uh, now you can see uh, why this population cannot be operated by cardiosurgeons, because uh, they are extremely high risk. Uh, the mean age of uh, my population was almost eight years uh, old. Uh, all of them had hypertension and uh, heart failure. Most of them had atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease, and chronic kidney disease. Uh, echocardiographic uh, examination before procedure relieved that uh, mean uh, left ventricle ejection fraction was reduced. Uh, it's about 40%. Uh, left ventricle diameter was increased both uh, end diastolic and end systolic diameter, and left atrium was also enlarged. Uh, now you can see that the numbers doesn't uh, fit because study population before uh, was 12% and after only 8. Uh, it's a last of follow-up because of uh, not ECG recording in control echocardiogram. Uh, but in this group, uh, I observe two, signif uh, statisti statis uh, two significant differences in left ventricle and diastolic diameter, and uh, GLS improvement from minus 11.6 to minus 14.7, and left ventricle ejection fraction uh, seems to be uh, the same before and after uh, procedure. Uh, 
so uh, the small study group, as it's a only pilot study and uh, loss of uh, four person in follow-up are uh, limitation of this study. Uh, but I have also some conclusion. Uh, this study suggests that there is association uh, with TIR and EDD reduction and GLS improvement, uh, and uh, probably uh, TIR influence on left atrial area and other uh, strain, but that requires further investigation. And the most important uh, conclusion for me is uh, this pilot study proves that uh, there is uh, feasible to further investigation and of course, uh, further investigation will be continued. Here is bibliography, and thank you very much. And thank you very much. This was a very interesting topic. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for this question. Cardiac surgery is first uh, method of treatment because it's a uh, complete uh, treatment of this problem as uh, mitral regurgitation and uh, trans edge to edge uh, uh, treatment, uh, so mitral clip, it's only partially, uh, only partially resolve the problem because there is still uh, regurgitation, but less than before procedure. So, no. So it is palliative uh, procedure. Yes, it's kind of palliative, but uh, I, there is no, it's not in the literature, it's palliative, it's alternative method of treatment. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The normal values of the echocardiography parameters. And this is the mean of normal values because you didn't divide it into the woman and man, for example, ejection fraction and the other parameters. It's mean, median, what mean, is? Mean value. Mean value. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion and for your paper. Now let's move to the next presentation. Presentation number eight, pain relief management in use of epistomy among Latvian ob obstetrician and midwives. And I believe this is online presentation. Is the participant online? Nikola Krista Ivanova or Anna Jadegauja? If not, let's move to the presentation number nine. SARS-CoV-2 and chronic fatigue syndrome, investigating long-term neurological complications. And uh, presentation number eight will be also read at the, the very end of the session. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Anna Słowińska. I am a MD and PhD candidate from Department of Neurology uh, of Medical University of Silesia. And today I am honored to present to you my research uh, regarding chronic fatigue syndrome as a complication after COVID-19. Uh, what is chronic fatigue syndrome? Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is a condition characterized by severe and persistent fatigue that uh, is not improved by rest, lasts for inadequately long time, and has no identifiable, uh, identifiable cause. 
So far, a uh, cause for this condition is unknown, uh, but potential causes uh, include dysregulation of the immune system, abnormalities in HPA axis. Uh, there are also many speculations that female gender and genetic predispositions may take part as well in developing of chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, this, condi this condition might be also triggered by uh, viral infections and environmental uh, stressors. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome prevalence in general population varies from 2 to 2.5 percent and in order to be diagnosed with such condition, uh, a person needs to meet diagnostic criteria called CDC in 1994. Uh, to meet this diagnostic criteria, patient needs to exhibit at least four out of eight listed by them uh, symptoms uh, for at least six months, and uh, diagn final diagnosis can be made only after uh, ruling out other potential causes. The aim of our study was to investigate whether COVID-19 can lead to the development of chronic fatigue syndrome, and if so, what other factors may influence it. Uh, for, the, for our study, we used anonymous online survey, uh, and we gathered data from 180 respondents. Uh, Using CDC 1994 criteria, we divided them into three groups. Those who had no symptoms at all, those who had some symptoms, so between one to three, and those who actually met diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and experienced at least four of the symptoms. Uh, only uh, only cri a criterion for inclusion was uh, to have um, infection confirmed by PCR test or antigen test. Obviously, limitation of our research was um, biased responses from respondents. Uh, Seventy percent out of 180 respondents was female with average age 33.4 years old, and 30% was male with uh, average age 30.5 years old. In our survey, we asked uh, respondents questions about these eight symptoms, if they started to experience them after COVID, or if they experienced them before and started to uh, experience them even more uh, significantly after infection. Uh, the most common complaint with uh, almost uh, 97 respondents uh, complained about this was non-refreshing sleep. Second most uh, common was cognitive impairment in 92. Uh, least common was tender lymph nodes. Out of 180 respondents, 13.3% met diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. This number is significantly higher than in general population, where it's only around 2 to 2.5%. 2 uh, we also noticed that among women, a uh, number, a percentage among women uh, for patients who suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome was sig significantly higher than among men. In women, it was almost 16%. In men, it was less than 8%. Uh, we also noticed that there was no difference uh, in mean age in those three groups. Uh, and we identified four potential risk factors for developing chronic fatigue syndrome after COVID-19. It, uh, it was symptomatic course of COVID-19, multiple COVID-19 infections in the past, history of head trauma, and history of psychiatric disorders such as depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorder, ADHD, OCD, and addictions. Is, SARS, uh, is COVID-19 infection linked to the chronic fatigue syndrome? Our research proved that yes, indeed, for both men and women, there was a significant association between contracting COVID-19 uh, infection and developing chronic fatigue syndrome. 
We also proved that for those who went through COVID-19 um, infection, uh, those who had history of psychiatric disorders or symptomatic uh, course of COVID infection or were female, they were in bigger risk to developing of chronic fatigue syndrome. We failed to, we failed to prove that age, uh, history of head trauma or multiple COVID infections in the past uh, were significantly associated with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. In conclusions, yes, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, is uh, more predominant in people who went through COVID-19 infection and history of psychiatric disorders, female gender and symptomatic course of infection can be potential risk factors for uh, this development. Uh, but we failed to prove that age, history of head trauma or multiple COVID infections in the past were connected to um, developing chronic fatigue syndrome after COVID. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, two questions. First, maybe I didn't get it. Uh, what was the time interval between the onset of the disease, I mean COVID-19, and the phone call that the patient received? That's the first question. And the second one, uh, do you consider adding a control group? For example, people who have positive uh, influenza infection because in this scenario, we don't see the picture whether the COVID is more likely to cause CFS or other viral, viral infections. Uh, okay, so uh, I will start with this second question. Uh, well, um, during COVID pandemics, uh, influenza was very much underdiagnosed in this, uh, so it's not really easy to establish whether these people went through those two combinations. But if we assume that they went through influenza in previous years and they started to uh, to experience the symptoms right after COVID infection proved by antigen or PCR test, we can uh, for now assume that uh, this, this risk factors are relevant, but this is a very good uh, idea for further research. And w what was the first question? The time lapse between the infection and the phone call. And the? Uh, oh, uh, where they, uh, when they responded. For all of them, it was more than six uh, months, for sure. Uh, most of them was uh, reported that they uh, that they contracted uh, COVID in 2022, most of them. Uh, but at this moment, I cannot recall um, specific uh, numbers. But all of them was for sure more than six months after infection, because we asked them when they know if they know where they were at this. Any other questions? I'm wondering and rather suggest that uh, the patients with psychiatric disorders should be excluded from the future analysis because uh, the analysis and the statistics for the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, will be uh, not clear mm -hmm. then. Yeah, this is the suggestion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please welcome the next presenter. This is the presentation number 10, optimizing of biological treatment of ulcerative colitis first step.
Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Przemysław Witek, and I want to present the preliminary results of my doctoral thesis, which is uh, assessment of effectiveness of biological treatment in patients with inflammatory bowel diseases using a new mathematical model. The work tutor is Professor Marek Wologa from the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Uh, today, I want to focus on the first stage of my study, which is to establish factors affecting the treatment outcome in patients with ulcerative colitis. And first, let me briefly uh, explain the matter of uh, ulcerative colitis, which is one of the inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, the etiology is multifactorial and exact mechanisms yet remain unknown. We say that certain environmental factors meet people with genetic predisposition. Also, the dysbiosis and dysregulation of the mucosal immune systems are present. And uh, the diagnosis is based on the colonoscopy with biopsy, also clinical features such as uh, diarrhea with blood, and uh, lab tests such as CRP and calprotectin levels. So having diagnosed our patient, we have to uh, decide which treatment option will be the most suitable for him or her. And uh, the standard treatment is, um, includes uh, anti-inflammatory uh, anti and immunosuppressor drugs. And if the Mayo score, which is used to assess the severity of symptoms, is low, then uh, we have good symptom control, we can uh, keep our patient the treatment, but if the Mayo score rises, we have to escalate our therapy, and one option is to use biologics or small molecule drugs in the therapeutic program, but patient has to meet the strict criteria of National Health Fund. Um, aim of this work is to establish factors affecting biological treatment uh, and identify parameters that can be used to predict the effectiveness of the treatment, because uh, the drug program does not take into account any individual patient-related parameters, and according to the literature, one-third of patients do not respond to induction uh, therapy, and another one-third does not achieve remission in the maintenance treatment. Here, as an example, I have the calculator for patients treated uh, with chemotherapy in uh, breast cancer, so my attempt in the future will be to construct maybe some similar calculator or some mathematical model to predict the uh, outcome of the treatment. Uh, moving on to the methods of 105 patients treated uh, in Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in University Clinical Center in Silesia. Uh, 95 patients met the inclusion criteria. The analysis, uh, statistical analysis was performed in IBM SPSS tool and uh, the symptoms severity, the treatment outcome was measured using Mayo score. So something more about Mayo score, this is a score that evaluates the severity of symptoms and um, it is based on four parameters. First is stool frequency, uh, then um, rectal bleeding, endoscopy, and general physician's assessment. Uh, minimum score is zero, maximum is 12. And for this study, the partial Mayo score, excluding points for colonoscopy, was used. Uh, moving on, uh, the treatment monitoring is strictly determined by the National Health Fund. I didn't translate this slide because this is extracted from the uh, official document from uh, National Health Fund, but that says that um, we have to perform specific lab tests uh, on colonoscopy and assessment in Mayo scale, and also it is determined when we have to perform it. So uh, at each admission, we have to perform uh, each admission we have here, uh, connected to the admission, uh, administration of the drug. We have to perform the assessment in the Mayo scale. We have to take blood samples from patient. And endoscopy is uh, performed at the first admission when qualifying patient and usually after two months after the uh, induction therapy. So, moving on to the results of 95 patients. We had uh, 57 men and 38 women aged from 18 to 75 years and the effectiveness of biological treatment was 70.2%. It means that this amount of patients have completed or are still in the program, they just didn't drop out of it. Uh, and average decrease in Mayo score was 4.4 points. First, I wanted to establish if uh, some baseline parameters, demographic parameters, some parameters that we check during the qualifying, if this has an effect on change in Mayo score, well, it has not, so no statistically, no statistically significant associations were found. Uh, later, I wanted to check um, if average levels of the parameters uh, has changed somehow during the therapy, and it was confirmed for almost all the parameters, excluding the CRP and calprotectin levels. And then, 
I checked if this change of those parameters was somehow affecting the change in the Mayo score. And it was confirmed for uh, white blood cells, for platelets, and for CRP uh, concentration. So it was, the, um, it was uh, checked between the zero week and the last checkpoint. Uh, so to sum up, uh, with the decrease of white blood cells and platelets and CRP, we have decrease in Mayo score. So that means that uh, some of the parameters required to monitor therapy have statistical effect on the treatment outcome. And that means that in the future, it can help to um, construct some mathematical model to predict the effectiveness of treatment of the ulcerative colitis. Thank you very much, and I invite you to the discussion. Thank you very much for your paper. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, which drugs were you using to induce uh, remission in this study? Uh, in this study, it was infliximab and vedolizumab, because uh, the drug program allows us to use uh, four types of drugs, which is infliximab, vedolizumab, ustekinumab, and tofacitinib. But uh, on the ustekinumab and tofacitinib, we had only 10 patients, so it won't come out in the statistical analysis, anything that will matter. So I just limited the study to the patients with infliximab and uh, vedolizumab. So when presenting the, uh, the results, it should be clearly stated which drugs were used because yeah. you cannot generalize I'm the... Sure. I think I had that, but I didn't mention that. It was in the inclusion criteria somewhere here. Oh, yeah. It was treatment with either infliximab or vedolizumab. Okay, but when you were showing the uh, regulation uh, papers from uh, our health insurer, uh, there were all uh, those drugs. Uh, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because it was like extracted from the official document. I, I should have mentioned that. That's right. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now let's move to the presentation number 11, Influence of Oxytocetergic and Vasopressinergic Systems on the Clinical Presentation and Risk of AST. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello, my name is Alicia Kavalec and I am a PhD candidate on the Department of Psychiatry of Developmental Age and uh, today I have pleasure to present you the uh, effects of the work entitled Influence of Oxytocinergic and Vasopressinergic Systems on the Clinical Presentation and Risk of Autism Spectrum Disorder. Uh, so uh, uh, let's start. Uh, let's start from the autism spectrum disorder itself. What is it? This is a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, that affects around 1% of the population. And speaking from the experience, a little bit more uh, on the medical universities. And uh, the main uh, f uh, future of this. Uh, uh, of this uh, disorder are deficits in social communication and also restricted, repetitive and inflexible patterns of behavior and interest. Both of them uh, need to arise early, uh, early and uh, must cause a significant impairment in overall functioning. Uh, so, we are sure now of one thing, that ASD has genetic origin, but we are not exactly sure how does it happen, because uh, how do we are sure because uh, it runs in families and its uh, heredity, it's uh, in the monozygotic twins, is at the uh, 60 to uh, 90 percent, but we are not exactly sure how does it happen, because there are over 3,000 of suspected genes. Uh, the one system that we are taking a close look at are the neurohormones, especially oxytocin 
niacin and vasopressin. And uh, why neurohormones? They are very old, very conservative hormones that uh, also can be found in invertebrate animals, and they are responsible for social behaviors. That's why they uh, are interesting for us. And uh, just to tell you, the oxytocin and uh, vasopressin are regulated by two enzymes, uh, the CD38, which is, uh, 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 which is used for the selection, and also the oxytocinase uh, uh, that is used for uh, the breakdown of uh, of the neurohormones. So uh, having this knowledge, uh, we designed our study like this. We took 80 subjects with mean age of 14 and a half and mean IQ of uh, 100. Uh, 27 of them were uh, typically developing and uh, 63 of them were with autism spectrum disorder. We drew their peripheral bl blood in order to extract mRNA and we made expression of the genes uh, coding the neurohormone fu functions and the elements that I have shown you before, the recept both receptors and enzymes. Uh, then we, each of the participants uh, was made ADOS2 uh, uh, questionnaire. This is the questionnaire that is a gold standard for diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder and uh, the more points you have the more traits of the uh, autism you present and we correlated the results uh, with, uh, of expression with the ADOS score uh, components. Uh, so now we can move to the results. And uh, here we have uh, the most uh, important graph. And uh, here you have the change in expression level. Uh, just uh, uh, for the clarity, the line in the middle stands for the, uh, the mean expression in typical developing uh, group. And the uh, uh, vertical uh, lines are for the expression of the ASD group and starting from the bottom from the receptors. As you can see the oxytocin receptor is expressed at the more or less the same level in the ASD group as in the typical developing group and uh, for the vasopressin uh, receptor it's a little bit uh, lower in the ASD group at the level of 0 0.8 uh, but the most important things happen up here because for the oxytocinase the expression is bigger at uh, 1.2 and uh, the secreting level CD38 is even higher uh, at uh, 1.4. So after we correlated uh, those expression with uh, elements of ADOS score, uh, here you have the network analysis based on the Pearson's correlation. And uh, the most important uh, uh, element here is the oxytocinase that is uh, uh, up here. Uh, uh, the, the LNPAP uh, and uh, uh, as you can see it's connected to the various elements of the ADO score especially elements uh, uh, connected with the uh, social communication, the social affect, uh, the social interaction and uh, uh, all of the uh, many uh, the, the another expression are mostly uh, the, uh, the expression changes are connected uh, mostly with the uh, oxytocinase change uh, with the oxytocinase so that we may uh, suggest that the another uh, changes in expression that have been shown before are uh, secondary to the uh, change in the oxytocinase. So now let's go to, uh, I want to show you why is this important. Uh, because uh, one, the b it seems that the balance between the level of the expression of the CD 38 gene and the oxytocinase plays a key role for the risk and the clinical for the risk and clinical presentation of ASD. Why is this unique? Why is this important? Because there are literally only a few studies about those elements. Uh, because about the CD, the, uh, the there are around, to my knowledge, uh, uh, seven articles connecting the CD38 uh, protein, the CD38 gene with ASD, and for the oxytocinase there is none. This is the first study that has uh, ever took the oxytocinase uh, changes into the consideration. And uh, the second uh, conclusion is linked directly to the first one because the genes that we are most frequently look at and uh, most uh, interested in ASD so far uh, for the receptors of uh, vasopressin and uh, and and uh, oxytocin seem to be at best of the marginal report importance for the risk of ASD. So uh, this is uh, the bi 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 bibliography and uh, now I will be happy to answer if you have any questions considering the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation and I hope you have some questions. Thank you for a very interesting topic. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, the method you've selected for 
for estimation of uh, expression of uh, oxytocinase. Um, I suppose it was performed from peripheral blood, yes? Uh, yes, exactly. So how can you suggest the connection between the central nervous system and the level of expression, mRNA in expression and the disease? It's because uh, when it's released, uh, it can be uh, found in the peripheral uh, system, but only for a very short time. Uh, so that's why uh, we are uh, prepared in our department uh, for the special process of collection, uh, because we uh, freeze blood uh, straight after the uh, after the uh, the draw, uh, so that uh, the expression can be uh, so that the level of uh, hormones and also uh, everything can be uh, checked at the moment. Yeah, I understand the, the, the methodology, but what's the connection between the brain and the peripheral level of enzyme? Uh, uh, because we are checking it in the, uh, in the genome, uh, so the expression of the uh, mRNA is the same in every uh, cell of the body, so that uh, we are using it in this, in this way. Any other questions? And which other department is involved in your study and the exactly laboratory and the gene expression measurements? the process of uh, gene expression are, is made on the uh, f uh, biomolecular uh, department of uh, uh, the uh, SHUM and uh, we are coordinating our work with uh, uh, docent uh, August Duma and uh, the uh, exact uh, techniques of the uh, expression are not known to me uh, exactly because uh, I am uh, not responsible for this uh, process, but uh, this is uh, uh, a study that is coordinated. Uh, the whole study that I am going to, that I presented you, this is only a smart part of the overall study that is uh, made uh, 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 with uh, coordination with a few other uh, departments because there, there are also parts of it uh, that uh, uh, part of the study that are, connect, that are uh, conducted on the uh, histology department too. And, uh, all to and I could show you just uh, this one part that is uh, made with biomolecular. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the presentation number 12, selected eating styles and diet quality among Polish adults, a cross-sectional study. Okay, we can hear you, so if you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, my name is Aleksandra Malachowska, I'm a PhD student at Warsaw University of Life Sciences uh, and in the Department of Food Market and Consumer Research, and my topic is Selected Eating Styles and Diet Quality Among Polish Adults, a cross-sectional study. I will show you preliminary results uh, of the last part of my doctoral research. And how to move to the next uh, page. Or should I share the screen maybe? Okay, I will share it. Okay, but you have to stop sharing your screen and then I will be able to... Oh, okay, I'll try now. Okay. Could you see it now? Okay. And now? Okay, great. 
Okay, so um, now I, I hope it will work. Okay, great. Okay. Come back. Okay, so let's start with a short introduction. So based on the current knowledge, we can distinguish two main types of eating styles, adaptive ones and maladaptive ones. And um, the examples of adaptive ones are intuitive eating and mindful eating, and they are based on eating due to internal cues, such as hunger and satiety cues. And the opposite uh, are maladaptive eating uh, styles, so eating due to reasons unrelated to biological hunger. So, for example, applying restrictions, restrained eating, eating due to environmental cues, so external eating, and eating um, affected by emotions. So, for example, eating when feeling sadness or anxiety. Uh, from many available research, we know that it may determine food intake and favor certain eating behaviors. However, those studies have some limitations. Firstly, we have limited studies within diverse study groups, so within, uh, within groups with also older uh, adults, not only young, uh, young participants and young women. Also, we have incoherent results of these studies uh, that assess uh, the link between eating styles and diet quality and we still uh, know little about intergender differences that may occur uh, while examining this association. So the aim of my study was to examine association between selected eating styles. I've chosen intuitive, restrained and external eating and diet quality in Polish adults separately among women and men. Uh, I've collected data between October 2022 and January 2023 with the CAVI technique, computer-assisted web interview. Uh, I've chosen convenience sampling and snowball sampling method to collect participants, and I've recruited women and men aged 1865. Uh, what about the study tool? Uh, I've chosen uh, two questionnaires that, uh, that were previously adapted and validated by me and my tutor. Uh, in the Polish population, so I've chosen Polish version of the intuitive eating scale 2 to assess intuitive eating and Polish version of the Dutch eating behavior questionnaire to assess restraint and external eating. Then I've calculated um, diet quality indices based on the, on, on the um, answers about um, frequency of intake of 24 food groups from Compan questionnaire. And last but not least, I've included metrics. Uh, I've used SPSS statistics to perform analyzes, and p-value lower than 0 0.05 was considered significant. Okay, let's move on to results. So, as you can see, I've gathered 708 participants uh, with a majority of women, 477 uh, women. And now let's take a look. Uh, let's take a closer look at at the scores for uh, for those questionnaires. So firstly, we have intuitive eating scale two, and uh, as you can see, uh, it consists of four main subscales. We have reliance on hunger and satiety cues. We have eating for physical rather than emotional reasons. Then we have body food choice congruence and unconditional permission to eat. And um, we've observed that men scored significantly higher in eating for physical rather than emotional reasons in comparison to women. Now let's take a look at um, external eating and restrained eating. Here you can see that women scored significantly higher in external eating and restrained eating in comparison to men. And uh, as I've, pr I've previously mentioned, I've calculated diet quality indices, and we have three of them. We have non-healthy diet index, pro-healthy diet index, and diet quality index, the general index, that takes into account um, two, previous, uh, two previous ones. And uh, men scored significantly higher in non-healthy diet index in comparison to women, and women scored uh, significantly higher in pro-healthy diet index and the general diet quality index in comparison to men. And um, the main results, uh, let's start with intuitive eating and diet quality uh, in the study sample. So in both men and women, uh, we've observed that non-healthy diet index correlated negatively with body food choice congruence and positively with unconditional permission to eat, while pro-healthy diet index correlated positively with body food choice congruence 
and diet quality index correlated positively also with body food choice congruence and additionally also negatively with unconditional permission to eat. Uh, additionally, in women only, non-healthy diet index correlated negatively with eating for physical rather than emotional reasons and pro-healthy diet index correlated negatively with unconditional permission to eat. And now external and restrained eating uh, and correlations with diet quality. So both in women and men, non-healthy diet index correlated positively with external eating and negatively with restrained eating. And both pro-healthy diet index and the general diet quality index correlated positively with restrained eating. So uh, the last part, study strengths and limitations. So definitely study strength is the fact that um, I've used only scales adapted and validated in the Polish population, also large study sample, and the fact that this was the first study to assess uh, both adaptive and maladaptive eating styles in the Polish population. Uh, however, we also have some limitations, the fact that we cannot determine the causality of associations here, um, and the fact that we've conducted the study with a non-representative study sample, so we cannot generalize uh, those results in the Polish population. And uh, the last limitation is the fact that we've assessed only select eating styles. To conclude, intuitive restraint and external eating may be helpful to explain diet quality uh, in women and men, and uh, we found out that it may, they may explain diet quality in a similar manner. Uh, however, we need uh, future research to include also other eating styles and confirm our observations uh, to be able to better understand the link between uh, those eating styles and diet quality and possibly to detect any other uh, intergender differences. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. It was really nice. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask a question regarding the uh, numerous limitations that you've uh, uh, carefully provided us with. And I have a, I have a question. Uh, what is your solution for your future experiments, for future studies to overcome these problems? Because at this point, these data are definitely not to be generalized. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think that uh, those um, this research should be um, should be conducted again, but within a representative study. So probably uh, with a little help from professional uh, market agency that would help us to reach a representative study sample. Yes, and my question is, to which group um, do you include uh, nocturnal eaters, or you excluded this type of eating? Mm, could you uh, repeat the question? To which group um, do you include uh, nocturnal eaters? So this is maybe another type uh, of eating, and I have only based my research on this one type uh, of division of eating styles. And uh, nocturnal eating, I say it's maladaptive eating, of course, because it's eating due to reasons probably unrelated to biological hunger, and it is some type of disorder. So I would say this is maladaptive eating. Thank you very much for your presentation. And let's move to the last in our schedule presentation. Uh, late diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders, the effect of specialists in inattention or patient characteristics.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martina Bien, and I'm going to uh, present a work entitled Late Diagnosis of Autism Spectrum Disorders, the Effect of Specialist Inattention or Patient Characteristics. Uh, the work tutor is Krzysztof Maria Wilczyński and Małgorzata Jana Skozik. So, autism spectrum disorder uh, is a neurological disorder characterized by deficit in social interaction, communication, and the presence of stereotype repetitive behaviors. Early diagnosis uh, and implementation of specialized uh, care in this population can positively affect their functioning and quality of life. Unfortunately, this disorder is often diagnosed late in life, which negatively affects the lives of neurotypical people and often leads to the development of mood or anxiety disorders. In Poland, uh, pervasive developmental disorders have been diagnosed only for 20 to 30 years, which is why there are no precise statistical data on the prevalence of ASD. National publications, however, put the prevalence at about 32 per 10,000 children. However, a common feature of the results of most studies of ASD conducted around the world is the fact that boys are diagnosed on average three to four times more often than girls. Women diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder are more likely to be diagnosed with co-occurring intellectual developmental disorders. This suggests that less severe cases may go undetected compared to males. So the questions arise. What factors affect time to ASD diagnosis? The study included 61 children with a confirmed diagnosis of ASD based on DSM-5 and ICD-10 criteria and then using the ADOS-2 protocol. The mean age in the study group was uh, 14 years and the average age, age of the first diagnosis uh, was 12.95 years. The mean diagnosis time, defined here as a period from the first visit to ASD diagnosis, was 3.5 years. There were 39 men, 63%, uh, and 21 women, 67% uh, in the study group. In the group of men, the mean age was 40.50 years, the first diagnosis was made at the average age of 11.1 years, and the mean duration of the diagnosis was 3.65 years. In women, the mean age was 30.85 years, the first diagnosis was made at the average age of 60.25 years, and the time to a diagnosis was 3 years. The difference in the diagnosis, uh, in the age of the first diagnosis, was statistically significant. So, all study participants were assessed of the following scales. The ASD diagnostic test, ADOS 2, uh, which is the gold standard of autism diagnosis in the world. Uh, during the examination, the diagnostician proposes to the child or adult several common activities and topics of conversations. ADOS helps to detect the autism spectrum in children from 12 months of age, but also in adolescents and adults. The subjects were also assessed in Star for Binet Intelligence Scale, which is an individual intelligence test that allows for precise determination of intellectual abilities and broadly understood cognitive functioning of the tested person. They were also assessed in the test for reading mental states from the eyes, RMIE, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Questionnaire, OCIR, and the INT Questionnaire, which is a questionnaire used to measure emotional intelligence, understood as the ability to recognize, understood, and control behavior and other people's functions, as well as the ability to detect functions in self-assessment and someone else level. The average BNET total score in the study group was 100 points, and the average ADS total score was 6.63 points. On the social affect subscale, the average score was 11.56 points, and for limited interpreted behavior, it was 1.87 points. Uh, you can see uh, the differences between women and men is in this study group, and all the observed differences were statistically significant. Women and men also differed in RMIE, OCIR, and in scales, which is another argument indicating completely different characteristics of girls and boys with autism spectrum disorders. The patient's age at first diagnosis was negatively correlated with the social affect score in ADOS. In other words, people who scored higher on ADOS scale were diagnosed earlier, which is a result that we may expect. 
In addition, a patient's age at first diagnosis is positively correlated with the OCIR score. Three, four people who scored higher uh, in the OCR score were diagnosed later, which may suggest that the presence of obsessive compulsive disorder may mask out its spectrum symptoms and three, four delay the diagnosis. Interestingly, the time from the patient's appearance at the specialist to a diagnosis was not affected by any parameter related to the diagnostic criteria for autism or intelligence. The time of diagnosis was con conditioned only by the level of emotional intelligence. So, conclusions. Professionals make an ISD diagnosis based on factors unrelated to ISD rather than focusing on diagnostic criteria. In addition, a high level of emotional intelligence can mask symptoms in people with ISD, making it much more difficult to make a proper diagnosis and implement uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have any questions? Thank you for your presentation, and I'd like to ask you, what do you mean by late diagnosis of ASD? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, question would be, do you have any idea why, the, as, I, as far as I know, the boys uh, were uh, more commonly uh, diagnosed? Is it just the epidemiology of the ASD, or there are other factors involved? So the moment when the diagnosis is late is for sure the moment when the uh, patient uh, is in uh, adolescent age because in this age we uh, cannot help him uh, in a proper way because when a child is diagnosed we can um, implement therapeutic interventions and there the functioning will be better. If you won't do that, uh, then the child uh, won't uh, be developing in a proper way. So when it's after 10 uh, years uh, uh, of age, it's a uh, late diagnosis. Uh, and the boys are diagnosed uh, <coughs> uh, in uh, this age, uh, probably because girls um, uh, better um, are better uh, functioning uh, with this diagnosis because uh, they have uh, a better skills in uh, emotional interactions, uh, just because of the of their sex. So that's why. Thank you. This is very interesting that there is no uh, correlation of the time of the diagnosis with the intelligence. Um, my question is: um, Is your data comparable to worldwide knowledge? Uh, yes, it is, but there were no uh, such uh, uh, big studies on this uh, topic, but uh, from these topics that we found in the literature, the, um, the results were uh, similar. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and there were two more presentations which I need to read again. The presentation number five, type one of diabetes mellitus in an interdisciplinary perspective. Is any of the authors online or maybe here? Hello, uh, is everything okay? Uh, yes, but please switch on the camera. Okay, and I think you need to share the screen to be able to... Okay, so if you're ready, the flow is yours. Um, dear professors, dear participants, um, my name is uh, David Conta. I'm from the Department of Pediatrics in uh, Bytom. My works tutor is um, Christina Stencil Gabriel. Uh, I would like to uh, present a topic about inter interdisciplinary perspective of, um, of diabetes. Today I'm not going to present revealing results from uh, big medical science, but I would like to 
um, focus on something we know a lot about in theory, but often forget in the clinical practice. Many factors contribute to this, but one of them is us, the, the, the medical professionals. Uh, all of us here today have been learning about the pathogenesis of diabetes, clinical management, and something else. Uh, we know that diabetes is a serious epidemic of developing and development and, uh, countries in the first uh, 21st century. Uh, we know so much, and still diabetes is a huge problem in Poland. Firstly, in terms on health, but so uh, also socially, financially, and something else. So why is this the situation? I think we don't have a problem with diabetes itself is a disease. We have a problem with its management about diabetes and uh, avoidable com complication with um, with this problem. So the aim was an interdisciplinary analysis of the problem of type um, uh, for diabetes in children and adolescents. In this work, I would like to focus on three aspects. First, incidence, second, uh, hospitalization, and first, uh, cost uh, with the provision of healthcare service. Uh, these aspects, I think, correlate with each other. The research material was the document information of the number of services provided uh, to the um, children with the diagnosis uh, against the entire patient population for the years 2016-2019. Um, um, uh, uh, statistical analysis of the data extracted from the records of the eHealth Center was performed uh, using statistical analytical programs. Uh, results. The number of the patient diagnosis with diabetes increased with age in the year considered. Over the years, the increase in diagnosis at the sample age of uh, 20 years was 30% from uh, 2016 to 2019, it's a 30%. We have a diagnosis, so what's the next? Um, implementation, of treatment, uh, implementation of treatment, which is um, related to the provision of the health science. Okay, results number two. Uh, in the years under um, consideration, the first two group, patient, patient up to eight years, the amount of service provided decreased, but in the other three, three groups, uh, patients eight, nine to 18, the amount of the service provided increased. We have more health benefits. What's about finance? There is a notable increase in cost for the healthcare of patients with diabetes. This is due to the increased volume of health service. Of course, this is influenced by many factors. Other factors may be the labor cost of medical professionals, e.g. And these are not complete data, you should know. This information is only from public health payer. We also need to think additionally about private healthcare system. Conclusion, medical professionals are part of the system. We have children, their families, their friends and others. All of this can interfere with how we manage the disease. We should work to ensure that the specific patient, specific children and adolescents, if the patient and family do not follow the recommendation or lie 
to us that they are doing everything as prescribed, uh, then the child health may deteriorate. The amount of health care provide increase and their cost over on stabilization disease, complication and other problems, health on others. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have any questions? I have one. Um, Please. Thank you for this presentation. I have my first question is about cost for patients. Because uh, we saw that the costs are increasing, uh, but also the number of patients increasing. And uh, the second question, if you have any data about the um, treatment they, uh, that the, the patient uh, get, uh, because we know that in type one diabetes, uh, the treatment methods, the, the pump therapy, intensive insulin therapy um, is uh, really um, um, evaluating very, very rapidly now. So, uh, if it is uh, related to the cost to the hospitalization um, that we, we spend on this patient? Uh, okay, thank you for this question. Uh, this, is, this is data from the total, uh, but um, we don't know what is the cost for one person because the Patients, uh, maybe I can show you. So this uh, about the the value, uh, we don't know uh, where is the patient on uh, basically a healthcare hospital emergency emerg emergency sorry department. We've uh, we've got uh, only about um, about the diabetes. This is the first um, uh, first. Mm, first, um, uh, mm, in English, uh, this is first diagnosis in diabetes. You know, but we don't know where in the hospital, in the uh, ambulatory, and in other. Okay. okay, the the second part of your question. Uh, because you show us the increased uh, amount of money we spend on these patients. And um, huh, I'm wondering if it is related with, uh, with not only with the disease, but also with the treatment we use, because this treatment is changing very fast and, and new technologies are <laughs> really entering uh, this disease um, treatment. So. Uh, could be the relation to the increase in the in the in this uh, in this part of the of the diabetes, or this is only the finances um, uh, from because I don't know how how you count these finances. Yes, we our healthcare system allows civilization civilization diabetes to continue. I don't know. Uh, it's necessary to change the the the, the aspect. Uh, you know. The, the the new methods, uh, new treatments, and other. So so the increase in the amount of money you show us it could be related to the number of patients we, uh, we 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 can see the increase in the number of patients year by year, but also with um, with the treatment we use in this patient. So I think this is the field to compare in your data okay. to analyze. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If not, thank you very much for your presentation. And let me ask again if there is an author of the presentation number eight. 
pain relief management in use of epistemy among Latvian obst obstetricians and midwives. And the authors are Nikola Krista Ivanova and Ann Yedkaucha. Are they online? If not, just cross out the presentation number eight, please. And with this presentation, I think we are going to finish this session because all the submitted papers have been presented. We congratulate all the presenting authors and participants of the clinical medicine session. At this point, I would like to ask the president of jury to, for a few words to sum up the session. Dear authors and uh, jury, uh, I'm delighted to be here again uh, on this Olympics of Science. A very, very nice presentations, very uh, nice presenters. Uh, the discussions was fruitful and I hope to see you on the next levels of your scientific developments. Thank you. Thank you very much for these words. We truly appreciate your valuable comments, accurate observations, and work on presentation assessment. We would like to cordially invite you for the decoration and closing ceremony of the SIMC 2023 conference, which will be held here in a free hall on the 19th of May at quarter past four. On behalf of Student Scientific Society, I would like to thank you all for participation in this session. And please don't go and stay for the photo. So can I ask you to come here for and ask all the online participants to switch on the camera so we can see you.